Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, this is the inaugural Richard and Leonora Hill Lecture Series on Frontiers in Vision Research, which provides funding to sponsor an annual lecture in vision science and research. So this will really be, this is like history making. You're all here, and this is the first one, and it will always only be the first one, and you will always have been here. Um, as you know, no pressure. No pressure. No pressure on the speaker. Um, as you know, as part of our centennial celebration last year, Dr. Buckeye Bob Newcomb wrote a history of our college, and I looked in the back, and Dr. Hill has 34 different page numbers after his name in the history. I didn't count for sure, but I'll bet that's more than anybody else. Um, as you probably know, he was the college's second dean, and he served from 1988 to 1995. So when I looked on one of those many page numbers today, I found that during his tenure, the college hosted a distinguished lecture series. And it, there were Nobel laureates who spoke, and really if you read down the list of people in that lecture series, that? it was a who's who of vision science at that particular time. So clearly, now Emeritus Dean Hill has been biding his time and waiting to use his now generous donation to create what he clearly thought back in the early 90s was something our college needed. So maybe it fell by the wayside, I don't know. We might have to ask him about that story, but it's back better than ever. Um, I will tell you that the college was assisted in the selection of the Hill speaker today by the Research and Graduate Studies Committee um, who unanimously recommended today's speaker. So I am deeply honored to welcome Dr. David Williams as the inaugural Hill's lecture. Hill Lecture. He is the Dean for Research in, take a deep breath before I do all his titles, Arts, Sciences, and Engineering. He's the Allen Chair in Medical Optics, the Director of the Center for Visual Science, and Professor of Optics, Ophthalmology, Biomedical Engineering, and Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Rochester. Um, he's one of the world's leading experts on human vision and has pioneered new technologies that are improving the eyesight of people around the globe. His laboratory developed an automated method to measure and correct the optical defects of the eye for more accurately than had been possible before, which has improved laser refractive surgery and the design of contact lenses, and is key to the technology that cam and cameras that are used even in these buildings that can take the sharpest photographs ever of the retina inside a living eye. He is a prolific author, an inventor, and a fellow of the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, the Optical Society of America, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's the recipient of the Tillier Medal from the Optical Society of America, the Bressler Prize from the Jewish Guild for the Blind, and Arvo's Friedenwald Award. He's trained many prominent faculty, names you would know, names in this room, at schools and colleges of optometry and in departments of ophthalmology, and one might say that if he's been lucky in the students who came his way, I'll bet they were, would say they were equally lucky in his mentorship. So if I were to do a little call and response cheer, this is, this is, an, this is going to be audience participation in a minute, um, if I were to holler, say, optics, you would yell back Williams. So can we try just two rounds of that? Okay. Um, optics. Williams. Optics. Williams. Optics. Williams. Optics. Williams. Great. So on that note, please join me in giving a hearty, hearty Buckeye welcome to Dr. David Williams. How can you live up to an introduction like that? <laughs> and the honor that has been bestowed on me uh, by your group and by Dick to give this first lecture, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to do that. So Dick, thanks so much, and, and your wife as well. Thanks so much for that, uh, that generous opportunity. What I want to do today is uh, start with a kind of a tutorial about uh, the high-resolution rental imaging work that we've been doing over the last uh, nearly two decades now. Uh, and, uh, and then tell you, give you a couple of examples of more recent work we've been doing to try to push the envelope of what that technology can do. And in particular, I want to give you at the end of the talk, after this tutorial is done, uh, two examples of how we're trying to move from structural imaging at a microscopic spatial scale in the retina to functional imaging, where we're actually uh, recording activity in some sense and changes in response of the visual system using uh, high-resolution imaging capabilities. So uh, I want to disclose some commercial relationships first. I have uh, financial support and work closely with two companies. Canon is one of them that uh, we're uh, co-developing 
a commercial version of uh, an adaptive optics scanning laser ophthalmoscope and a company called Pogen Polgenics here in Ohio uh, that uh, is interested in vision restoration in various forms. And there are a number of patents that I'm the inventor on that the University of Rochester has licensed to these, these and other companies. Well, uh, our uh, involvement in, in high resolution retinal imaging really started with this publication in 1997, and we really worked throughout most of the 90s to try to get to this point. It was, it was diffi a difficult task, but Zhejiang Liang and Don Miller were uh, both uh, postdocs working with me at the time. Don had been a graduate student in the lab, and we developed this early instrument that you see there, which is a so-called flood-illuminated adaptive optics system at the University of Rochester. And this was really, um, we were very excited about this first, um, first project because we, we have this conviction that it ought to be possible to image the retina at a, uh, at a very fine spatial scale. And this fly through, through the eye shows you that. There's a one centimeter uh, square there at the outset, outside the eye. And as you look in, if we go two orders of magnitude finer than that and look at a conventional fundus image obtained with a commercial modern fundus camera, this is the kind of uh, structure that you see. How's that? Is that better for everybody? Yeah, I apologize. Forgot. Um, but this is the kind of structure you can see in a conventional image, which is basically essentially nothing. This is a very good fundus camera, but it's, which is, but it's not equipped to give you microscopic uh, spatial scale uh, at, when you're looking at something that's a, a square 100 microns on a side. Does this work on these screens? Use the pointer. Use, Use all three screens then. Oh, 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 here, here, okay, very good, thank you, very good. But uh, with adaptive optics uh, retinal imaging capabilities, the same retinal region looks like this through one of those cameras, in which you can see the individual uh, cone and rod photoreceptors in the eye. The large cells here are uh, cone photoreceptors, roughly uh, six or seven microns in diameter, and the smaller cells are two micron diameter rod photoreceptors available in a, in a living eye. Now, there are a whole lot of reasons why uh, our current technology is able to achieve images of this quality. And this particular image, by the way, was taken by Alf Dubra in collaboration with Joe Carroll based on our AO technology. One of the best images, I think, that has been um, collected with this, with this technology. There, there are many factors that, um, that are involved in, in collecting images like this. It's not just about adaptive optics, although adaptive optics is an important component of that. So I want to take some time in a minute to explain how that works for those of you who are not familiar with the technology. But first, let me back up and tell you about the general challenges that one encounters if you want to take a microscopic picture of the inside of the living human or animal eye. The first challenge is the one that adaptive optics addresses. It's optical blur. Those of you who are familiar with the wave aber aberration of the eye, and I'll explain what that is in a moment, but you know that you have uh, maybe a little less than one micron RMS wavefront error in the eye. That's a lot. There are a lot of optical defects in the eye, and that is a fundamental impediment to being able to resolve cellular spatial scale structure inside the eye. So adaptive optics addresses that, and I'll explain how in a moment. But there are other problems. A second one would be the low retinal reflectance. For every, in the middle part of the visible spectrum, for every 10,000 photons you pour into the pupil, you get one photon back. Uh, given the need to ensure light safety, that you don't deliver too much light to the eye, you don't want any smoke, believe me, uh, you will have problems. So you, you really need to limit the amount of light that you deliver, and you're always getting 10 to the fourth, and in some cases, as little as 10 to the minus 5 back, um, back from the, uh, in the, in the retinal reflectance. So we have to use very sensitive light detectors in order to capture every single photon we possibly can and use every one of those to form a, an image of the retina. Now one strategy, if you're an astronomer, you might think, well, one strategy that uh, you could use would be to collect those photons over time. Just bathe the retina in a relatively dim, safe amount of light and then just harvest that light as it comes back and eventually build up enough light that you could have a, a good image of the retina. And this is, in fact, what astronomers do. They'll point their telescope at a star, and they'll wait all night long, in some cases, to collect enough, enough light to see what clearly what it is that they're interested in looking at. But the problem with doing that in, um, in retinal imaging is that the eye is always in motion. And the motion is severe. 
even in a very carefully fixating normal eye, the RMS fixation variability might be on the order of 20 microns. If you're trying to look at a 2 micron rod photoreceptor, you've got image motion that's 10, an order of magnitude larger than the cells you'd like to, like to image. So we need to address eye motion in a way that does allow us, us to collect photons over a long uh, temporal interval. And, and we've been working hard to try to, uh, to try to address that problem. And, and just last week submitted a paper that I'm, uh, I'm very happy about because it's the culmination of about a decade of work at developing better and better uh, image stabilization methods. This started with work by Scott Stevenson and, 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 and Austin Rorda at the University of Houston um, more than a decade ago now. And, uh, and um, uh, Steve Burns at Indiana University was part of a consortium also with, with us to try to improve this capability. And now at Rochester, we just recently, working in collaboration with Canon, have developed an eye tracking capability that allows us to stabilize the um, retinal image with an error of about 200 nanometers, which is uh, two orders of magnitude uh, uh, smaller than these eye movements. We can reduce the eye movement by about a factor of 400 now, uh, allowing us to, uh, uh, to, to lock on to single cells in the retina and stay locked on for long enough to harvest a lot of light, enough light to get a high signal-to-noise ratio image. Now, another problem is that the retina evolved to be transparent. Um, it has to be. Light has to pass through the entire inner retina in order to land on the photoreceptors where the light gets absorbed and the uh, absorbed light is, is converted to an electrical signal. And uh, so the structures in that inner retina that you'd also like to see have very low contrast typically. Not only do you get very little light back from them, say a 60th roughly, the amount of light you might get from the photoreceptors, but it's also the case of the contrast of those structures um, is very um, is very low. So I'm going to be showing you examples of how we address that problem. One of those techniques is the use of fluorescence imaging, and I'll have an example of a special kind of fluorescence imaging we've been using recently to do this functional imaging I'm talking about. And then finally, another limitation of looking inside the eye. If you want to do your experiments on living eyes, and maybe I should stop and say that's a fundamental premise or assumption underlying all of our work is that we want to image living eyes, not dead eyes. Dead eyes are very interesting. You can put them under all kinds of microscopes and insult them as much as you want. Um, but we would like to be able to track ultimately patients who are suffering from retinal disease. We'd like to have a better understanding of that disease in vivo, in, in a situation where you, you would have no option of removing the retina. And we'd also like to be able to track the efficacy of therapy for retinal disease. In, in real time as, it, as uh, those therapies are, 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 are developed in, in human patients or even in animal models, it's useful to be able to keep the retina inside the eye while you're, while you're doing that sort of evaluation. Uh, so anytime you're looking inside an eye, you have a limited spectral window to look into. And I'll explain uh, some tricks that we're currently using to, or one trick we're currently using to overcome that limited spectral window and, and how that's implemented. Well, the adaptive optics piece of all this, correcting the uh, optical defects of the eye, draws its inspiration from uh, astronomy again, where uh, all modern high-performance uh, telescopes that are ground-based that have to look through the atmosphere of the sky uh, employ adaptive optics, like, like this one, the Keck telescope in, in uh, Mauna Kea, at the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's a uh, binocular telescope equipped with a both both uh, eyes, so to speak, are equipped with adaptive <laughs> optics now. Uh, and uh, it's uh, really essential to see through atmospheric turbulence because what happens when light uh, leaves the star, it passes for millions of light years through space, unperturbed by space. And then in the last microsecond, just before you collect the image, it goes through the atmosphere, it gets all screwed up. And so what adaptive optics does is it measures what the atmosphere does to the light as it passes through. Uh, corrects that scrambling of the light just in time to form a sharp uh, image on the telescope. And it's really been the, uh, a real boon to uh, high resolution uh, imaging in astronomy, as many of you probably uh, have known for some time. So what's happening in the eye? How do, we took this technology and applied it to the eye back in the, in the mid-90s. And if you had a perfect eye, first you need to understand the wave aberration. And I know many of you are expert on that. But uh, just for, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, if you put a beam of light into the eye like you just saw and let it 
reflect back out or scatter back out, you'll, if you had a perfect eye with no optical defects, you'd have a planar wavefront, a nice flat surface emerging in the wavefront emerging from the eye. But in all real eyes, we all have aberrations. So when you put this uh, nice pristine wavefront into the eye that's planar, it comes back out warped like this. Now in this cartoon, I've exaggerated that warping by about uh, three orders of magnitude. So it's, it's a thousand times larger than it actually is in the real eye. But nonetheless, it's distorted, it's warped, and that's what causes poor image quality. Both if you're trying to put a really sharp image onto the retina, or, as in the case of today's talk, if you're trying to take very sharp pictures of the inside of the eye and you're collecting light coming out through the eye. So what we need to do first is measure this shape. This, the shape of that wave aberration is a complete description of the monochromatic optical defects of the eye. So it's a very important thing to know. So first we have to measure it. If we can measure it, then the next step is to correct it. So let me tell you first how that measurement uh, is done with a little bit of history. Uh, dating back to 1961 when uh, Smirnov, a Russian scientist, published a, a, uh, a paper that was relatively unknown until wave aberration measurements became popular in vision science and in optometry and ophthalmology. And Smirnov, it's really a wonderful paper, well worth going back and reading the English translation um, of it. Um, and what he says, though, and, and I won't elaborate on how he did this, but he had a very uh, tedious psychophysical method to uh, measure the wave aberration of the eye, much different than the modern methods we have today. And he said at the very end, and this is a little, a, a little um, tutorial or a little maybe um, advice for students in the audience. He said, therefore, it is unlikely that such detailed measurements will ever be adopted by practitioner ophthalmologists because it took so long to collect the data and even longer to, to process it. And uh, just a little word of advice, never say uh, it's unlikely anything will happen, because uh, it probably will happen. Because Smirnov could not foresee the advent of modern computing. The digital computer was not yet really uh, on the scene. And by 2001, I think one of the important contributions that we made to this field was not to invent wavefront sensing, which others had invented before us, but was to automate wavefront sensing so that you could uh, acquire the wave aberration in a very small fraction of a second. 200 times a second if you want to now, um, although mostly we do it at video rates. Um, and this is work done in collaboration with Pablo Artal and his colleagues in Spain, and Heidi Hofer, who was a graduate student at the time um, with me at Rochester. So the ability to make this measurement rapidly was, was really important. Well, how do you make the measurement in the first place? Well, here's what a wavefront sensor looks like. It's got two components, and let me go back. Well, let me leave it where it is. So, it's, two, two, it's very simple. It's got a lensed array at the front. That's just, um, like it says, it's an array of little lenses that take the wavefront that's coming out of the eye and, ca and slice and dice it up into a lot of little mini wavefronts, each of which um, collapses to a point on this light detector, the CCD, at the, at the back of the wavefront sensor. Lensed array wavefront sensor, or lensed array and CCD, that's all, all the components that are really important for this, understand how this thing works. And you'll notice that if you have a perfectly, I'll go back here, if you have a perfectly regular aberration, uh, a planar wavefront coming in, you get a perfectly regular array of spots on the, um, on the, on the wavefront sensor of CCD. And that's what you get. But with a, an aberrated wavefront, watch what happens. Now you have this uh, distorted wavefront coming in. Those spots get scrambled in their positions on the CCD. So all a wavefront sensor does is it automatically measures the displacement of each of those spots, and the displacement is proportional to the slope of the wavefront at that point in the pupil. So what you get out of this is um, uh, you have an array of coordinates of the different locations of the pupil because this lens, lens of array is conjugate with the pupil, and on the CCD you have an array of displacements that tells you what the wavefront is doing in that location. So that's how you measure the wavefront. Now how do you correct the wavefront? Well, in our adaptive optics retinal imaging systems, you use a deformal mirror. So you cast one of these distorted wavefronts onto a mirror that is pre-distorted in just the right way so that the light reflected off the wave, the deformal mirror is planar. And that pre-distorted shape is, has exactly the same shape as the wave aberration, but half the amplitude. And that's just what you happen to need in order to get a, a planar wavefront out. And so the trick then is to 
marry your wavefront sensor to your deformal mirror in such a way that you can measure correct, measure correct, and stay locked on the wave aberration, which is dynamic over time. It's changing in large part because of fluctuations in accommodation. And so you want a, you want a system, if you're going to image over long periods of time, you want a system that's always measuring and always correcting. So let's put all these, these two components together and you can see how this works. And I, I recognize this is a tutorial for many of you, but here we've got our wavefront sensor over here, over here on the left. We've got our deformal mirror uh, here and the eyeball, of course, is over there. So what we're doing is we're, we're casting light on the, into the eye, forming a spot there, coming back out, reflecting off the deformal mirror and then into the lensed array. The lensed array is setting sending some uh, information to the computer, which is computing control signals for the, um, for the deformal mirror. You iterate on that several times. Then you can deliver, deliver a light flash to the retina, and that light flash comes back and, say, falls on a CCD array in a flood illuminated system, and you get an image sort of like this, not really quite as good as this, because there's some other tricks that we use to make these images as good as they are, uh, in particular, confocal scanning is a, is a key component of collecting this image. But nonetheless, that gives you the flavor for how an adaptive optic system works. You measure and correct typically at, around, at about video rates so that you can stay locked on the wave aberration over time. Now, one of the earliest uh, applications that uh, we put to this was to try to understand what the uh, relative numbers and topography of the three classes of cones are like in the living eye. And, and this was a, an attempt to address a problem that, was, that really arose from right back at the, in, in, in the, the very first clear articulation of the idea that color vision in the eye depends on three kinds of channels. And Thomas Young was this brilliant, brilliant guy who made so many contributions to our understanding of the wave nature of light, hieroglyphics, and, and, and color vision. And his seminal paper in 1802 made this very succinct statement about the trichromacy of vision and having three channels, but we didn't know what the relative numbers of those cones were in much detail, at least. Uh, nor do we know how they were arranged in the uh, in the mosaic, with the exception of one of the classes of the S cones we knew something about, but the LM was was quite a lot more mysterious. And I did want, also for the benefit of the students, I did want to show you the kinds of, re of reviews that Thomas Young was getting at about the time he was doing this really, really classic work. And so you can read a couple of excerpts from some of the reviews. Uh, this paper contains nothing which deserves the name, either of experiment or of discovery, and as it is, in fact, destitute of every species of merit. We now dismiss for the present the feeble lucubrations. Now, I don't know what lucubrations is, but I know you wouldn't want to get caught lucubrating. Uh, I'm sure of that, of this author, in which we have searched without success for some traces of learning, acuteness, and ingenuity that might compensate his evident deficiency in the powers of solid thinking, common patient Ouch. But you know, I've got some reviews like that. Does this sound familiar to you? Yeah, so, so you know what I'm talking about. And I just wanted to show this for the students because what you need to do is you need to take these quotes, as I have done, and paste them in front of your computer. And when those negative reviews come in on those first papers, you can think, ah, oh, I'm just an unrecognized genius, just like Thomas Young. And the more negative the reviews, the more you must be a genius like Thomas Young. So it helps. It really does. You'll feel better if you take my advice on this one. Anyway, Thomas Young had this brilliant idea that there were three kinds of cones, but we didn't have a way of knowing how they were organized. And so Austin Rorda, by the way, you knew a lot about the spectral properties of the three classes of cones. And Austin Rorda, uh, working in, in my group as a postdoc, and then later Heidi Hofer, um, uh, developed methods that combined retinal densitometry, which was a method of that uh, uh, Fergus Campbell and William Rushton and others have pioneered uh, much, much earlier. But now we were able to combine that method with uh, adaptive optics to deduce what the pigment must be by bleaching the, the, uh, the cones selectively with different wavelengths of light. And, and, and it, uh, Ignoring the details for now, we were able to to uh, reliably identify the uh, the photopigment that must be contained in each of the uh, the cones. And this is an image from a, a pseudo-colored image from a uh, human retina that shows one of the first ones we did that shows the topography of cones. A random arrangement of long, middle, and short wavelength sensitive cones. You can see the well-known paucity, scarcity of uh, S cones in the, in the retina here. And 
one of the things that became very clear, and there had been some psychophysical evidence that this must be true, must be true before our work, but it was shown quite, uh, I think, quite convincingly uh, with adaptive optics imaging that people with normal color vision vary enormously in the relative numbers of cones in the retina. The S cones are relatively constant in normal eyes, but the L, the long wavelength sensitive and middle wavelength sensitive cones, vary enormously from by over a factor of 40 from uh, in different eyes. So here you're seeing examples of mosaics from different uh, subjects. These gray and dark regions are just regions we did not analyze because there were blood vessels obscuring the cones. But the important point for now is this huge difference in how these, these mosaics look. You might think that the um, color vision of these subjects would be radically different. In fact, it's remarkably similar in, in each of these subjects chooses uh, a wavelength that is unique yellow, that is neither reddish nor greenish, that's within just a few nanometers of all the others, despite this huge variation in, in, the, um, in the topography of the retinal mosaics. And maybe this highlights one of the nice features of being able to do this kind of microscopic anatomy in living eyes, is that you now have the luxury in those same eyes, because they're living, of doing psychophysical experiments in tandem with your anatomical observations. And so you can look at colorblind eyes and know with some certainty now how colorblindness is affecting, uh, colorblindness of many different kinds is affecting the, uh, the mosaic. And then you can also do psychophysical experiments to study the impact of each kind of mosaic on vision. And I won't say much more about that in the interest of time, but there's a whole um, long history of, of work that Joe Carroll largely has pioneered, another postdoc in the lab, um, and I'll show you one of my favorite, it's a, it's, it's a dated one, but again, but one of my favorite examples of, of how you can, you can use um, adaptive optics to learn new things about how the retina is organized. So Joe, within a few weeks of coming to the University of Rochester um, as a postdoc, showed that a normal trichromat has a, a nice, uh, uh, relatively uniform mosaic. You see some variation in the reflectance in cones, but don't worry about that. Note how different it is from this colorblind individual, this is a deuteronope that has a particular uh, mutation, that's called the LIAVA mutation, in the gene that codes for the M photopigment. And you can see small dark regions, about 30% of the cone seem to be missing in this, um, in this retina. And we know from psychophysical experiments on the same individual that, um, that he is blind in those locations. He has little scotomas where these dark regions are. So um, this person is colorblind, but for a very different reason than most people are, are single gene dichromats are colorblind, this sort of garden variety colorblindness. Because the, sing, the typical kind of colorblindness has this kind of mosaic. It's a complete tiling of cones, but there are only two kinds of pigment in the eye. And here's a new kind of colorblindness that's caused not, by, um, not only by missing a pigment, by, mi by missing some photoreceptors as well, due to a particular mutation. Um, so I, I want to now segue from this to what Joe has been and, and his colleague now at the, uh, uh, at the Medical College of Wisconsin have been doing recently because Alf Dubra, his colleague, has, um, has been pioneering some uh, new ways of looking at, uh, at photoreceptors in particular with adaptive optics retinal imaging that uh, I think are really exciting and promising and they build on work that Ann Elsner did at Indiana University many years ago before the invention of adaptive optics. And Steve Burns has also been doing a lot of interesting work with this, basically the same methodology. And I'm going to do short shrift on the methodology itself, sometimes called off uh, um, uh, uh, light scatter detection, sometimes split detection. It has many different names. But, but the basic idea is to, to move your um, confocal pinhole on your confocal microscope or ophthalmoscope off axis. And um, what this uh, shows, this is also that, um, th this shows normal retina looked at with this method. And you can see uh, the split detection down below, normal or the usual conventional adaptive optics retinal imaging above. And you can see how, just how much clearer the cone inner segments are with the split detection imaging. And they almost look three-dimensional because what you're doing by moving your detector off axis is you're getting kind of a side view in a way of the, how light plays off of uh, receptor inner segments. Now why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because now we can go back and ask, well, what really is happening in those dark spaces in the LIAVA retina? What's happening here? Well, if you image these same patients now with split detection, 
you get an image looking that looks like this. This is the overlay of the two images. And you can see in, in locations that are marked here in the original AO, you can see that there actually are inner segments there. Why is that important? Why is that interesting? It's interesting because what it means is that this person, though he's blind in 30% of his retina, his photoreceptors are alive. They're just not generating outer segments that are, that are expressing viable photopigment. So if you had a genetic engineering method that allowed you to correct that genetic defect, you have a much greater chance of resolving this problem. Now, you don't really need to work. This guy's doing fine. But um, there are many mutations like this that produce severe blindness. If we had a method which allowed us to tell whether the inner segments are viable or not, as this method seems to be, it could be very exciting for deciding who might be interesting candidates for gene therapy and other therapies that may be coming down the line. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're doing in that uh, direction at the end of my talk, time permitting. But um, you can use split detection also to look at blood flow. Here's some an example of an uh, image, uh, this one uh, in collaboration with Canon, Steve Burns it, is also doing um, work like this. Many of you have probably seen that. And uh, Jesse Shalek at Rochester has been looking at um, very high magnification images of single capillaries. And those are individual red blood cells. You can even see the shape of a red blood cell, that cup shape that's characteristic for erythrocyte in mouse using this method. And finally, there's also the interesting possibility that we can see other structures in the retina, in the uh, uh, vitriad to the photoreceptors, that is toward the vitreous from the photoreceptors. And here's some of Jesse's work where he's showing that you can image the array of horizontal cells. These are horizontal cell bodies in mouse retina using split detection. So it may be that this will open up a new way of looking at lots of cell classes in the retina that have been otherwise uh, transparent and, and inaccessible. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, our work in uh, two-photon imaging. This is a fluorescence imaging method that tends to address that problem of the low contrast of structures in the retina. This is work that uh, I'm doing in collaboration with Jennifer Hunter and Robin Sharma, and also Chris uh, Palszewski and his wife, Rasna Palszewska, at um, Case Western here in, in Hawaii, in, uh, in Ohio, and also um, uh, at, at Polgetics, which is the company that Chris owns. So two-photon two imaging, you all probably have heard about this, or you're neuroscientists, you know all about it because it's becoming a ubiquitous technique for looking at the brain because of its ability to look deeply into tissue. Um, we don't really care so much about that property. So the property that's valuable to neuroscientists is not so, so valuable to us. Well, uh, that's the intrinsic axial resolution I'm referring to here. But um, it... Um, uh, it allows us to excite otherwise inaccessible molecules, and it al allows non-invasive -in imaging of in individual cells and functional measurements. And I want to give you some examples of what we're doing to try to exploit that property of two-photon imaging. Okay, so, and this harks back to that problem I raised earlier of the limited spectral window we'd like to image through, all right? That's illustrated here. This white curve shows the ocular transmittance. So if you're trying to get light in and out of the eye, you've got to use wavelengths that, that fall inside this envelope here. If it's outside, you're out of luck, so uh, using conventional imaging methods. So for example, the excitation spectrum from, from a molecule called NADH lies out in the UV outside of that spectral window, and it would seem to be completely off limits for imaging in the living eye. And that's too bad because NADH is a metabolic marker. It tells you interesting things about the metabolic activity and, and viability of cells. You'd like to be able to image that molecule. Turns out there are a whole lot of molecules that have fluorescence excitation spectra in the UV that are not accessible with conventional methods. Well, two-photon is this clever little trick that allows you to get around that. And here's how it works, okay? In two-photon imaging, you use infrared light, which passes through the window, all right? Infrared in. 730 nanometers nominally. Now, the key to two-photon imaging is that when you put in two photons of 730 nanometers, it behaves like a single photon of 365 nanometers through this nonlinear optical principle. So two photons arriving in a molecule, fluorescent molecule uh, of long wavelength behave like one of short. So 
by, if you make the intensity uh, high enough. So by using the right intensities, you can get it as though you're, per, you're exciting with 365, even though you're really de delivering infrared light that gets through the window. Now everybody knows, right, that fluorescence is always at longer wavelengths. So the light that's generated by that 300 anomaly, or 365 nanometer excitation, actually comes back at longer wavelengths that pass through the window. So you can get into the window, but through this nonlinear trick, you can excite molecules that normally you could not excite, and then the fluorescence comes back out through the window so that you can collect it and make an image. Here's the, I won't go through the details of the system, but the key is to use a, a, uh, an ultra-fast laser, a femtosecond uh, laser, to deliver very brief but very high energy pulses of light to get this two-photon effect. Turns out that in ex vivo, this, these are not in vivo images here, these are ex vivo images, but they il illustrate that all cells in the retina have very nice contrast signatures in two photon imaging. Ganglion cells, the inner nuclear layer, outer nuclear layer, photoreceptors, they all have um, a rich signature if you can get enough light back without damaging the retina. And, and I should emphasize that there are risks that we're confronting because of the amount of light required to get this effect to work. But in vivo, Here's the kind of uh, image you can get. Here's a conventional reflectance image in a monkey retina. When you can see the, the cones and the rods are uh, not super clear there, but I think you can see them between the cones. And if you then, uh, in that exact same location, collect a two-photon fluorescence image, you can see you get uh, a very similar pattern, but now you're looking at a completely different aspect of the uh, photoreceptor topography than, than that which is used to just generate a, a fluorescence image. Well, what is, it's different, I'm claiming it's different, but how different is it? What, and what is the source of this fluorescence? We don't know. If you look in the literature, uh, people claim that the source of the fluorescence is retinol, which is a, um, one of the stages in the retinoid cycle that I'll come to in a moment. Um, but in fact, there's no clear, strong empirical evidence yet for exactly what the fluorescent molecules are that are producing this phenomenon. But there is a lot of interesting speculation, and that's all it's going to be for the purposes of today's talk, that it is related to the retinoid cycle. So the, what is the retinoid cycle? It's also called the visual cycle. When a photon comes in, it uh, bleaches the photopigment molecule. The photopigment molecule then goes through this whole series of um, uh, chemical uh, uh, events. And many of those, the ones uh, highlighted in yellow here, are two-photon autofluorescent. Okay. So a lot of these molecules, the photopigment molecule itself, 11 cis, is not very fluorescent, nor is all trans retinal, but retinol is, and, and retinol ester is, and so we think what we're looking at is, uh, it's a whole different way of looking at photoreceptors. We're looking at um, a functional, this functional sequence of, of molecular processes that happen in the photoreceptors when they're exposed to light. And the reason why that's interesting is there are many different kinds of diseases that interfere with the retinoid cycle. And if we had a way of monitoring that cycle, we might have a handle in, in understanding exactly how these diseases devastate the retina in, in the different ways that they do. So just to show you the functional properties of this method, um, this is ex vivo again, not in vivo, but we've seen this in vivo. I won't take the time to show you the data. But if you expose the eye to light, you bleach, it, bleach the uh, photopigment, you get an increase in fluorescence, not because of, the, of, the, of some passive consequence of the photopigment, but because you're generating this photoproduct, which we think might be retinol, though we don't say, we can't say it way. So you get this increase in, in um, reflectance. And these are in vivo measurements show, that show you, you can measure the dark adaptation. Since we can image both rods and cones, we can do it independently for the two receptor classes, and you can see that you can, um, uh, you can get quite different time constants for rods and cones, where the cones are recovering more rapidly than rods. And both receptors are recovering much faster than the photopigment. So there's much more theoretical work to be done on this, but we think we have a handle on monitoring the retinoid cycle in single photoreceptors in living eyes using this method. And we think that might be valuable for studying a number of different kinds of retinal diseases that affect the retinoid cycle. Now to finish off, I'd like to uh, tell you about another kind of fluorescence imaging that we're doing. In this case, in the previous case, we were using endogenous fluorophores. That is, whatever those fluorophores are, retinol or something else, they are present in the living retina. 
And now I want to uh, segue to an experiment that involves our introduction of fluorophores that give us a novel way of studying the retina. You probably know that the field of neuroscience is undergoing an incredible revolution right now, and I'll be very surprised if a Nobel Prize doesn't come out of some of the work that's been done to develop ways of using fluorescent molecules to monitor neural activity. I'm thinking of Carl Visseroff and Ed Boyden's work, for example. This is another example of the, the, the brain bow, so-called brain bow technique from Lickman and Sains at Harvard. Lots of, just an explosion of ways of using fluorescent molecules to study the nervous system. And with our adaptive optics capability of microscopic imaging of the retina, and knowing the retina is part of the central nervous system, we have a way, combining these methods, we have a way of looking at uh, function that's, um, that capitalizes on that revolution uh, and also capitalizes on our AO, uh, AO capabilities. So the, the science, science question that's driving our interest in this is what ganglion cells are doing. There are 1.2 million ganglion cells in each of your eyes, roughly. 1.4, take your, take your pick, something like that. Seems like a big number, right? But it's a small number because you wouldn't be caught dead anymore with a one megapixel cam digital camera, right? You, you won't settle for anything less than 10, you know, uh, 10 megapixels, right? And yet, in each eye, we only have a one megapixel camera, basically. Moreover, the angle, angular substance of your visual field is way larger than a typical camera. So you distributed those 1.2 million fibers over a huge uh, uh, solid angle, which is an interesting thing. And then furthermore, there isn't just one class of ganglion cells, which each, with each ganglion cell representing a different location of the visual field. You actually have on the order of two dozen different classes of ganglion cells. Um, so you've divided that 1.2 million up into a whole lot of subclasses that are responsible for conveying all this information that you're seeing right now uh, using your very smart brains, right? You're piecing this all together from a, really a very impoverished data set of information coming in from the retina. So our interest is, why do we have all these cells? What are they good for? And uh, I have to take you back. I don't, I'm not sure you're going to be able to read this, but I'll, I'll read it for you. I'll take you back to a paper by, a uh, well-known paper by somebody named Horace Barlow and then another guy named Dick Hill. <laughs> Dick Hill, and, and then also Levick, um, Barlow Hill, Levick, very famous paper showing that rabbit ganglion cells are, uh, some of them are directionally selective. And I just want to read you the last conclusion in this very, the seminal paper because, uh, you know, it shows, this was published 51 years ago, more than a half century, and it shows you that they were really on to sort of the way people who study retinal physiology are thinking today. It is concluded that direction and speed of motion as well as localized dimming and brightening are abstracted from the retinal image by separate classes of ganglion cells in the rabbit's retina. And this is the key. Hence, the analysis of sensory information is carried much further in two synaptic layers in the retina than is commonly su supposed. So even back then, Barlow and his friends were thinking the retina really is an interesting little uh, microprocessor that's doing much more than just passively conveying the uh, the image up to the brain. And those of you who love melanopsin containing ganglion cells, or the so-called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, understand this because we relatively recently discovered a whole new class of cells that we never would have believed 10 years ago existed um, that are intrinsically sensitive to light. They uh, relatively uniformly tile the retina and have a very specific set of functions, for example, controlling pupil diameter and controlling the uh, circadian clock uh, Andy Hartwick knows this uh, better than anybody probably here. And, and so every time we learn something new about retinal organization, we learn that there are new um, uh, specific independent circuits in the retina that are computing important things for seeing. So the retina is much smarter, that's my main point, much smarter than especially my snobbish cortical physiologist, would, would, uh, who many of you know. Uh, would lead us to believe, right? The Tony Mobsons of the world who think everything happens important in the brain. That's important in the brain. The retina is still doing an awful lot of work, and we don't know exactly what it's doing. So our point is, and I'll try to be brief here because I'm running a little over time, but our, our point is that what we need to really find out what all these different classes of ganglion cells do is we need a new kind of technology to be able to record not from one of them at a time with a single microelectrode. That's too tedious to get 
a large enough population of each of these 24 cell classes to figure out what they are. Nor do we really want microelectrode techniques. Uh, you can use microelectrode array techniques, which multiply the number of electrodes you can use in an individual session. But even then, it's an acute preparation with a retina and a dish. What we like to have is an in vivo method in a living, intact living eye, monkey eye preferably, that allows you to record from large numbers of ganglion cells at once. So the way we're, we're just beginning to pioneer this method, and we don't, I don't want to overclaim uh, what we can do because we, I won't tell you anything you don't already know about the retina with it. Um, but I think it is a promising approach that may allow us to do retinal physiology in a whole new way uh, that we haven't been able to do before. So what we do is we take a virus, an AEV virus, and we package with it the um, genetic machinery to produce a particular fluorophore. And take your pick. I'll tell you about the fluorophores in a minute. So we inject, the, um, say, a mouse or a monkey eye with this uh, into the vitreous with this uh, virus. The virus by itself is benign and doesn't do anything damaging to the eye, but it does go and transfect a whole lot of cells, in particular ganglion cells, for what I'm going to be showing you. And then those ganglion cells start uh, spewing out and you can find within their cell bodies and within their dendritic fields and so on, lots of fluorescent molecules. So in a mouse eye, you can get results like this. This is YFP expressed in individual mouse ganglion cells imaged in the living mouse eye with, with adaptive optics. And in monkey, using a somewhat different method, this, these images happen to be from uh, a rhodamine dextran experiment with similar idea. Uh, and you can see in vivo, you get images like that compared with what you see under a microscope on the right at two different numerical apertures. But the, the cool thing is that not only can you just express passive fluorophores like YFP or GFP, you can also express molecules like GCAMP6, which are uh, fluorescent molecules that are also calcium indicators. So as neurons increase or decrease their firing rate, the fluorescence changes. So by monitoring the change in the fluorescence over time, you have the opportunity of monitoring the electrical activity of ganglion cells in vivo uh, in, in, in living monkey eyes. So for example, visual stimulus uh, delivered to the center, center of the phobia, and then we image off to where their ganglion cell bodies are that serve those cones on the right. And I think you can see here that when the grating stimulus comes on, you'll get the, the red arrows indicate cell bodies that increase their fluorescence, and the green arrows indicate cell bodies that decrease their fluorescence with the same visual stimulus. So um, we're just beginning to use this, but we're excited about it because we, we can image several hundred ganglion cells at a time, and we don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to do thousands. Uh, ultimately, that's not going to be a tactical limitation. There are other limitations, such as the toxicity of these uh, fluorophores, maintaining stable preparation, getting them uniformly expressed within the retina, and so on. So this is not a slam dunk. But I think it's an exciting possibility that may allow us to answer the question that never has been answered, whether the primate retina has directionally selective ganglion cells in, the, um, in, in its uh, repertoire of, of circuits uh, in the retina. So uh, I think that it has a very uh, interesting future, and only time will tell where that's going to go. And I, lastly, I just want to very briefly mention that we're also interested in using this in vision restoration, and, and we're collaborating with Connie Sepko, Botan Roska, and David Gam to try to use adaptive optics to more rapidly assess whether attempts to restore vision in the blind are successful, and that's going to be a major push for the next five or maybe ten years. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <laughs> okay, I can, you know, yeah, you know, I love to have my picture taken. <laughs> and everyone, one last round of applause. For my <laughs>